For those who may be just looking in with us this morning via the CD or the television, in whatever way you're receiving it, we're engaged in a study of the word of reconciliation. I hope when we finish this that there will be a series that will help people be converted to Jesus Christ. I hope that it will be for anyone who wants to use these particular lessons to put into the hands of those who are serious about studying the Bible and that it will serve to help them come to a greater knowledge of the truth that sets all men free. So we continue with this particular study this morning, reading again 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Here Paul says to the church at Corinth, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That passage again is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Now the us, the us in verse 19 to whom was committed the word of reconciliation, refers to the apostles of Jesus Christ, who in verse 20 are called, as we've noted in earlier studies on the word of reconciliation, the ambassadors of Christ. When you think of the ambassadors of Christ, you should think of the apostles of Christ. When you think of the apostles of Christ, you should think of the ambassadors of Christ. Remind you that they are, that is, ambassadors, people who possess plenty potentiary power. Remember when we pointed out that any ambassador, official ambassador, from, let's say, the United States government to some other government, that person is official. He bears credentials of his authority from the government. That if any other government wants the official position of the United States government on anything, then the ambassador to that country is the only one that has plenty of potentiary power to state officially what the position of the United States is on any given thing pertaining to the government. Now, the only ones that have that plenty of potentiary power as far as telling us the will of Jesus Christ our Savior, who, remember, is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes of the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Who also said that all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. That he is the one who saves us, and he saves us through the apostles, the ambassadors that he chose. And their credentials came to them when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, as Luke records by inspiration in Acts chapter 2. What were those credentials? Well, they could work miracles. That is, that which no man could work, and thus they had to have more than human power to work those things. They could do what no mortal could do by his own human nature. Why did they have those things? To prove that the word they were speaking came from heaven and not from men. And thus, they were proven to be the ambassadors of the court of heaven to man on earth. Now, this word reconcile means to bring back a restore to agreement, concord, or favor. Now, back to ambassador. An ambassador is an officer then, as we've studied, of rank. I say again to emphasize that he's sent by one government to transact business with the government to which he is sent. As an ambassador, he receives his instructions from the government sending him. His duty is limited by these instructions. The apostles, as ambassadors, 
were sent from the court of heaven, as I've said several times already, to the court of man. Now, why all of this? Well, we're preaching about the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation presupposes alienation. Persons who have always been on terms of amity and friendship are never reconciled. It's only those who have become estranged, separated. So alienation presupposes wrongdoing. Where no wrong is done, friends, in the very nature of things, never become enemies. The wrongdoing may be by one or it may be by both parties. With men, one may be in the wrong in the beginning. But usually with men, both generally get into the wrong in the end. Man is fallible. Man is finite. Man is weak. It was man who sinned against God and all have sinned, Paul wrote, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death. And death means separation. Now when we sin against God, we separate ourselves from God. Thus we're alienated from God. And is it about to dawn on you why we refer to the alien sinner? He's been alienated by his own sins. He's not a friend with God. He's separated from God. Thus, if we're studying such as we are, the word of reconciliation, it should begin to be impressed upon our minds that it is by the word that men are brought back together or reconciled. Not just any word. We're talking about the inspired word of God. Now, that's the reason that all Scripture is inspired of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That's why it's called the perfect, complete law of liberty. James 1, verse 25. And that's why Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But he says of men, you know, there, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, wholesome teaching. But they shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears and shall be turned away from the truth and the fables. Now when that happens, they're turned away from the word of reconciliation. They're turned away from the only avenue whereby they may be reconciled to God. Thus, the only avenue whereby their sins can be forgiven. So it's man's alienation from God. Man in this case is and was holy in the wrong. Man is the guilty party. God is the innocent party. Wrongdoing on God's part, being what God is, is inconceivable. Where two parties are at variance, one holy, completely innocent, the other holy, completely guilty, it is then the province of the innocent party to propose the terms of reconciliation, which in the case of forgiveness of sins on our part, since all of sin comes short of the glory of God, is set out in the message of the gospel of Christ. No wonder it's called by Paul the power of God to save because it's the word of reconciliation, Romans 1.16. For the guilty one to do so would be the height of presumption, that is, to propose terms of reconciliation. He's the offender. He's the reason there's separation in the first place. It's possible for persons to be so separated in a relationship that they cannot even approach one another. In this case, there is the need of a mediator. A mediator is necessary. The office then of a mediator is to remove the difficulties so the alienated ones can be united, can be brought back together. To him also then are committed by the innocent party, I say the innocent party, the terms, and in this case, or word of reconciliation, the gospel of Christ, the New Testament message of salvation. Now, in man's alienation from God, 
Again, I emphasize, man is the guilty party. Sometimes you'll hear somebody get it all mixed up and say, God needs to be reconciled to man. No, 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 no. God never left man. God never ceased to perform everything he ever said he would do for man. It's man that left God. He left God by sinning. And when you read the first three chapters of Genesis, you'll see how sin entered the world. So God is the innocent party. He's the one that proposes the word of reconciliation. He's the one that has revealed it on your level and my level of understanding. Now in the primeval state, if you would call it that, man was pure. He had sweet communion with God because there was no sin in the world. Have you ever tried to imagine that? I suggest you can't do it. We're so involved with sin, it is so engulfing all of us that you can't imagine a world where there was no sin or the consequences of sin. But that pure man and woman, knowing no sin, Adam and Eve, in a very evil hour, transgress the command God gave them to do. They partook of that fruit that God had forbidden them to eat of, and that brought woe into the world because the door to sin was open for Satan. And thereby, they became separated. And because all have sinned, not that they inherited it from Adam, as the false doctrine of Calvinism teaches, but they all sinned. The opportunity to sin was made possible by Adam and Eve choosing by their own free will to break God's will. And thus, as the scripture says, they became alienated in their minds and as Paul said the Colossians by wicked works Colossians 121 now this separation was of such a nature as to require a mediator a mediator a go-between now in all of the universe and in all of the spiritual realm there was but one single solitary being the great second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, the immaculate Son of the living God, who possessed the qualifications for a mediator. Only one. I want you to keep that in mind for this afternoon's lesson when I say only one. In 1 Timothy 2.5, Paul commented on this to the young preacher Timothy. There is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. God then, as the innocent party in this matter, proposed the terms upon which man could return. And he and be restored to this pristine purity as if he had never sinned. And that's rather amazing how God has solved the sin problem. So that man could once again be in communion with God, though he had never sinned. And that's important because God says he's perfectly just. And if he just dealt with things from the standpoint of perfect justice, then when you sin, you die, and there's no room for forgiveness. But the gospel terms of salvation present a merciful God and a loving God who wants that great gulf that separates us and makes us alien to him bridged. And it took the Christ to do that. So these terms he committed to Jesus Christ, his son. And via the power of the Holy Spirit, after Christ was back in heaven, following his death, burial, and resurrection, Christ gave them to his apostles, the one he chose to be, his ambassadors from the court of heaven to earth. He would say something like this. In fact, that's what he said in several places, but... In John chapter 17, verse 8, he said to his father, For I have given them, the apostles, my ambassadors, the words which thou gavest me. Then Paul could write in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, concerning his own work as an apostle and the rest of the apostles of Christ, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, where is this word of reconciliation to be found? What is it? What is it when found? I don't think there's any more important questions ever offered for solution to the human mind than those two questions. Man, 
is alienated from God by his sins. And if he is not reconciled to God, he is doomed to pass through the gloom and shadows of this world, miserable indeed because he bears the guilt of sin. He has no, if you please, star of hope to cheer the pathway and to drop at last when it's all over with from the miseries of the guilt of sin in this world to an eternal darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. But, on the other hand, if man is reconciled to God and he fully appreciates that blessed fact, this life, is a place to get ready to meet God in heaven as a saved person, a reconciled person. It's a continual feast because we live according to the teaching of the scriptures and we know that's the way God gets us through life, reconciled to him and into heaven. And even the waters of death lose much of their chill because we can more readily day by day see the gates of heaven swung wide for us at last to admit us into joys unspeakable and glory unimaginable. As this word of reconciliation was committed to the apostles, the ambassadors of Christ, in our search for it, and man must exercise what God's given him to do, and that is his mind that he can think with and study with and ponder with and his will to make choices and find God, for that's what life in the flesh on earth is all about. To fear God and keep His commandments is the whole duty of man. To misunderstanding that is to miss the word of reconciliation and the benefits of it and what it has for the person in this life as he believes and obeys it and is led by it in order to get to heaven. There must be then repentance on his part. There must be a changing of his ways. He can't say, well, I'm sorry for my sins and continue in them. He's got to renounce those sins and turn against those sins and embrace the teaching of the doctrine of Christ and say, this is going to be my guiding light the rest of my days on this earth. Neither should we come this side of Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, for when he wrote, it had already been committed to them. For he said, it had been this word of reconciliation. So where then between the call of the apostles to be what Christ chose them to be, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, and the writing of this language that we've read is anything committed to them that can be properly considered a word of reconciliation in which the whole world is interested or certainly should be. You know, it's not found during the earthly ministry of our Lord. He sent his disciples out to preach to the Jews. We call that the limited commission because he commissioned them to go only to the Jews. He limited them as to where they took that message. And that's important to understand in the right division of the word. Notice Matthew 10, 5 and 6. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It then must have been after Jesus arose from the dead and is found in the Great Commission, and that's the reason we call it a Great Commission. It describes it perfectly which was given by Jesus himself to the apostles originally, and that just before he ascended to heaven. The different records of this are interesting. Most of the time we basically quote Matthew's record of the Great Commission and Mark's record of the Great Commission, but consider all of them together, for each one of the books about the life of Christ ends with the Great Commission it has to do with proclaiming the word of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. That man might know the way back to God to be at one with him again. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And then even more so with Mark 16, 15, and 16 do we find familiar words. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Then we come down to Luke's record of the same commission. In Luke 24, verses 46 and 47, Jesus speaking to the same ones, the apostles. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then we come to John's account of the same, and we find him saying, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Then he said this, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now you remember it was on that first Pentecost day, a Jewish feast day under the law. That you have devout men gathered out of every nation under heaven. In other words, they're loyal and faithful to God through the only law they had, the law of Moses. They're devout men. But it's time for the law to end for the Jew. It's time now for the great commission of the New Testament system. The authority of Christ presented therein to reign upon all men. All men would approach God through the gospel covenant, the word of reconciliation for all men. And thus the apostles, the account of which you read in Acts 2, are baptized in the Holy Spirit. All sorts of miraculous things came upon them to establish to those that were there that this is from heaven and not from men. And we have Peter standing up with the eleven, speaking to these men, all those at Jerusalem, the word of heaven, and in so doing, offered proof incontrovertible that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Messiah, the Son of God, and that no one else was there offered as a mediator between God and man to reconcile men save Jesus. For he had paid the price. They had put him to death. Peter charged them, you have taken the wicked hands of crucified and slain the Son of God. But then he declared that such was prophesied in the Old Testament. And that David himself had said that he would rise from the dead. He would not leave him any longer in the tomb to suffer corruption. And that God had highly exalted him. And that now he sat at the right hand of God ruling in the heavens. And it was at that point that they were picked in their heart. These devout men gathered out of every nation under heaven. To do only what they knew God wanted them to do under the law. That they were picked in their heart and they cried out as believers, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter took them as believers in Christ and said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises unto you and unto your children to all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he exhorted them and said, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And those that gladly received his word were baptized, and they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. The deed's done. The word of reconciliation preached. Men who believed it submitted to it. And they were at one with God again in the church of the living God. For the scripture also says, and he added, such as were being saved to the church. That church that Jesus built to house the saved, Matthew 16, 18. The church he purchased with his blood, Acts 20 and 28. When he shed his blood on Calvary's cross. And that great mediatorial act that no other man could do. 
For he and he alone have been tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. And thus, as John said, when Jesus came to his baptism, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Thus we preach Christ and him crucified. We preach the gospel, as the commission said, originally to those ambassadors of heaven, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So here in these accounts of the Great Commission in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, here is the word of reconciliation worldwide in its amplitude. The end of this word of reconciliation is remission of sins. Exactly what God intended. And when a man's sins are remitted, he is no longer an alien. But he's at one with God. Now, putting all these records together, plus what we've studied from Acts chapter 2, on the day the church started, it is found that the word of reconciliation committed to the apostles of Christ, his ambassadors on earth from heaven, contains this teaching. And it teaches a great lesson about rightly dividing the word of truth. We must take all of what the Bible says on any given subject before we draw our conclusion as to the meaning of it. And so we look at Matthew and Mark, Luke, and John, and we see in Matthew and his great commission, teaching and baptism and teaching. We see in Mark, preaching. We see faith. We see baptism. We see salvation. In Luke, we see preaching. We see repentance. And we see salvation. In John, we see preaching. And we see salvation. And when you combine all of them together as they speak by the will of heaven through the Holy Spirit, here's what we have. You have the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's power to save us, which is the word of reconciliation. You have the terms of pardon God has set down in that great gospel. You have not only the preaching, but as you look at all four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have also faith, and you have repentance, and you have baptism and you have salvation. And that's the old, old story of the cross and its benefit to mankind and the great word of reconciliation. We'll continue the Lord willing with this, I hope, simple but powerful message of God as to how men are saved from their sins, how they become Christians, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church Jesus built and living faithful to him until life is no more. And then there shall loom before us vast glories and amazements and fruits delectable that are eternal. It shall make this simple little life and a life of hardship pale into insignificance. And I'm quite persuaded that whatever we faced here that was difficult in our service to God will cease to be upon our minds as we walk the streets of gold arm in arm because of the word of reconciliation and our belief and obedience to it with Jesus himself. If you're not a child of God, now is the time to become one because all the time you're certain of is now for today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. As a child of God, if you've sinned, you need to reflect back on these things to motivate you to root that sin out of your life in repentance, turning from it, Praying God once again for forgiveness that you might be faithful to God even as you were when you rose from the watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. The great message is heralded out. Now it's up to you to receive it and act upon it that salvation might be yours. Why not do that while together we stand and sing?